your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. All right. Thanks for tuning in to For Better, Worse, or Divorce podcast, where we provide you tips and insights on how to navigate divorce and child custody situations here in the state of Texas. I'm Brian Walters, and I'm joined today by a special guest star, one of the associate attorneys from our Houston office, Raya Jackson, to discuss updates to the Texas Family Code. Welcome, Raya. We're happy to have you join us. How are you doing today? Good. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, you know, where you went to school and law school and um, all that type of good stuff. I grew up here in Houston. I'm a native Houstonian, just not native and used to the heat um, still. Um, I uh, went to school, high school, Carnegie Vanguard, which is now located, I think, uh, downtown somewhere. Um, I grew up in the rough side of Houston, uh, what we call South Park, uh, southeast side. Um, I went to law school at South Texas College of Law here in Houston as well. I graduated prior to then from the University of Houston, the main campus in political science. Um, after Shortly after getting licensed, I knew that I wanted to continue to work in the field of family law, which I've been lucky to work with you, Brian, since 2014 or so. And so um, I started doing ad litem work where I represent children and um, parents in CPS cases. I also do amicus work and um, attorney ad litem work where I find people <laughs> uh, in publication cases. Um, but we also do divorces, custody, support, everything under the sun. And so I feel lucky to be here. Um, I've spoken on different topics like this before through the state bar. And so it's interesting to see the law change so much even since me getting licensed it just constantly changes and so um, i think it was a great idea to kind of get together and try to itemize as much as this as we can and kind of talk about the hot topics yeah absolutely so just so everybody knows every texas has a very unusual situation that our legislature doesn't sit around for all the time and make laws it only comes in regularly it comes into session every other year for just about five or six months. So sure enough, we just had, um, it's always an odd numbered years because elections are an even numbered years. And then they uh, start sitting in January that, that follows right after that. So we had an election uh, this past November and then the new folks came in uh, to the legislature in January and wrapped up in um, at the end of May, early June. And so this happens every two years. We have changes are made to all kinds of laws, um, but uh, we're going to focus on the ones that change the family code and things related to to divorce or child custody situations. And there's quite a few of them. I'll say most of them are fairly minor kind of tweaking things um, or maybe they apply to very rare situations. But there's several of them that uh, that are pretty, pretty wide ranging and I think will will affect uh, affect things. Um, I think the two that <laughs> everybody's wondering if they'll ever drop that, that haven't dropped and don't seem likely to occur is some kind of 50-50 parenting presumption. That's not the law. Um, and, and or some type of uh, alimony uh, rules here that are more than just kind of minor ones and that that isn't happening either so no news on those fronts there's rumors every year they're gonna do a 50 50 or whatever and and it never happens or at least hasn't happened yet so let's um just talk maybe in order of kind of what you think are some of the more important ones we'll cover some of the bigger ones and if people need to know more information they can always contact us later we'll give you some some contact info at the end of this it's also in the show notes so so tell me ray what's uh, what's the first one that comes to mind that's a change the first one that comes to mind is going to be the changes to what we call temporary orders or that phase of a family law case um, where your case has been filed someone's been served or is about to be served but what we call a temporary restraining order so there have been changes made as to the type of request that you can make and just so everyone is clear, temporary restraining orders do expire. They have an expiration date. They only last 14 days after the judge actually signs those. Um, we can extend those only one time for another period of 14 days. 
Um, and typically, I would say, especially the Houston area, typically does uh, what we call joint and mutual temporary restraining orders, meaning they will apply to both parties. And the, the short of it is it, re it requires parties to participate in the litigation in a uh, in a manner that is not harassing to each other um, and that the court tries to keep some friction down because the court, I think, even realizes that this is a very uh, sensitive and emotional situation to go through. And so uh, because I would say Harris County especially does not have standing orders um, that apply to every court, what they do um, typically do are put things called temporary restraining orders in place. Um, and so the main change that they've made is that for the temporary restraining orders after the filing of your lawsuit for the dissolution of a marriage or a divorce, um, or if a party requests it, or the court can just do it on its own motion, um, the court can grant a temporary restraining order that requires you to refrain from tracking or monitoring personal property or a motor vehicle um, that's in possession of a party and without the party's uh, effective consent. Um, and so that's irregardless of whose name the vehicle is in, for example, I, I know I've had clients that, you know, said to me, well, you know, it's in my name. I should be able to track the location of this vehicle while we're, you know, waiting on a hearing um, or so forth. But the court can put orders in place temporarily um, under this, this amendment that states that you are not allowed to track the locations without the express consent, which I would say probably in writing, probably very clear as to what you've agreed to. I wouldn't uh, tell my client to, it's okay if you verbally agree um, to do that. I would try to get that memorialized in some type of text message, email, some type of written correspondence um, in regards to that. Um, and that also includes, you can uh, use an a tracking application um, such as, I think they have one called like 360 or, you know, one that you add for your family or find my iPhone, for example, uh, people will track each other's locations with that, um, or physically following that party or causing another, um, to physically follow that party. So, um, for example, in one of my amicus cases, I had, um, parties who his sister was following the wife. Um, and trying to catch the wife uh, committing adultery. And so she would drive around in her truck and take photos and follow the wife around. So in that example, um, going forward, you know, after these, um, uh, after this amendment, uh, if the court signs a temporary restraining order um, prohibiting the parties from that behavior, that type of behavior will not be acceptable and in fact will be against the court's order. So two questions. What about a licensed um, private investigator? I assume that's still okay, it would seem like, or what do you think about that, how it's worded? Well, I'll say uh, when this amendment first came out, that was my first question is, what about our PIs, right? Our private investigators, they have licenses to do this. Would, I, I'm, my first thought would be that the law would not um, immediately eliminate a a complete area of employment for some people, right? Like if those, if that was the case, all those people would be out of a job. So I don't believe that this applies to them, but I would say in the case that you are not sure, I would draft a proposed temporary restraining order that specifically states um, in the portion that says what is authorized um, behavior, that that would not apply to a licensed private investigator for this purpose. Yeah, I mean, I think here what the courts or what the legislature is trying to do is to, yeah, stop the stop stalking, stop, you know, anything that's kind of too nosy. But on the other hand, I mean, there is some, especially if children are involved, there's going to be some interest in, you know, are the children being left alone or whatever. So, um, yeah, you might want to craft this very carefully. The other thing is, um, you know, is when somebody's on a like an i you know an iPhone, everybody's an iCloud or whatever, a family iCloud. You know, that's that's kind of the more gray area I think it now at this point, which is that that's people don't understand that that's going on and that they can track where you are, um, and they haven't uh, given their explicit permission. They haven't forbidden it, and you know, someone could just say, "I didn't do anything. It just popped up on my you know on my iPad. It just shows me. It's always showed me where my wife is at a given moment and my kids. And 
I guess that sounds like that's probably illegal now. You'd probably have to go into your iCloud and turn that off, I would assume is how I'd read that, which is probably not something most people are going to do. They're probably not even, many of them are not aware of it. And, um, and so that's, this could be a little bit of an issue. So I think we need to be real good about telling our clients about what to do and not to do in these situations. And because by the way, this is normal, right? Your, your wife suddenly leaves after you've been together 20 years and doesn't tell you where she is and you've been suspicious about her and a coworker, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she's got your kids with her. What, you know, I mean, it, it's not necessarily all creepy stuff. It, it's kind of normal, I think, some of it. Um, so we just need to keep our clients in the, from uh, unwittingly violating a court order. All right. What's, a, what's another one that, that comes to mind as being important? Well, before we move on, I want to also just touch um, on what you said about the children. I've had a, quite a bit of uh, clients um, or opposing party um, put air tags or other tracking tiles or devices on their children's um, personal belongings. And pers people do that as parents, you know, just they want to know where their kid is or they don't want their if their kid got kidnapped, they want to know where they are. Right. I mean, that's all totally normal i think um, that's what that's kind of invented for but go ahead right so i mean i would still advise my client to be very careful about that because if the child is in possession of the other party and you know that then you could obviously be tracking the location of the other party not just your child and could be violating this uh portion of a temporary restraining order yeah i mean we could, we could have a whole podcast just on this issue i mean let's say you got a 15 year old and they have a phone, right? You gave them a phone, going to want to know where your kid is and their phone is. And, and so, well, yeah, where that's going to show where mom is too, if the kid's over with mom. So, and that, that could be a violation of that. If you, depending on how you look at it. I mean, I think there's going to be some reasonableness as there always is in a courtroom. So anyway, all right, next, uh, next topic or next change that you thought was important. Uh, protective orders. So that was a huge uh, change. I agree. This one is uh, quite, quite the change. Quite the doozy. So um, I would say recently I had a case out in Brazos County prior to the change, obviously, and uh, we had to um, choose to, uh, well, we had to prove a couple of things. We had to prove that family violence had occurred and we had to prove that it was likely to occur in the future. Um, the court found that we had not met the burden to show that it was likely to occur in the future. And therefore, that protective order application was denied. I was able to clearly show by the facts that my client had been physically assaulted by her husband, that he had thrown things at her. He even admitted to doing so on the stand and under oath. But the parties had been separated for a long period of time. The family violence was, as far as time goes, um, there was quite a bit of time between the assault and when we were finally having the hearing. My client was uh, from a different country and uh, had recently come to the United States and was seeking um, some type of protection from her husband. But this new change changes everything um, in that sense because um, the prong of cho uh, proving that family violence is likely to occur in the future has been eliminated. Yeah. And so that's really important. And I have a, since I've been practicing a long, longer than you, I have, a, you know, even more of a history on it. When um, I was in the Austin area, when um, I guess protective orders really started to become a thing, I think they were in the law before, but they, they got expanded to who they would apply to and, and all of this. And the courts, I think, were really looking at that time, it's about 20 years ago or so, you know, 25 years ago, looking for a way to protect people, right? I mean, it's natural. You, you know, somebody's in an abusive relationship, you want to protect them. And so they started handing out the protective orders. Um, and I think they started to go a little overboard, in, at least in Austin back in the 90s and early 2000s, and they would hand them out. And I think they kind of ignored that whole part of it about likely to occur again. And they just assumed if it happened once, it's likely to occur again. And, and it got really out of hand and word got around Austin and people would just come in and automatically file a protective order application because they figured it'd be granted. And, and it, the and reason that's a problem is that if, let's say you have children together, you're married or not. And if you have a protective order that goes into effect, that will affect the custody case and can be actually really 
really a big deal in the custody case. And so people were using, I think, in some cases, not just to protect themselves, but either solely or in addition to that to gain an advantage in a custody case. The judges in Austin, you know, wised up to that after a few years and, and got to the point where they were pretty much, you know, deny them unless they felt exactly what you said that it was likely to occur again. Um, and so it kind of returned to normal. This removes that. I mean, what, what this law says is that, let's say a husband and wife have been married for 20 years and there's never been a, an issue. They get really mad one evening, they both do, and they both push each other. Um, or let's just say one, just say the husband pushes the wife. Let's just say that. Um, doesn't necessarily hurt her in any way. It apologizes afterwards. Um, never happened before. I promise it'll never happen again, et cetera. That, that allows the wife, as I read this, to get a protective order. Um, and again, if they have kids, that's going to cause all kinds of issues. Now, maybe that's justified, right? But it is, it is a big change because I think almost any judge looking at that particular situation would say this is not likely to occur again and not, not grant the protective order. Um, so that's, I think we're going to see an explosion in the number of protective orders that are filed. And I think um, that will affect custody cases where they really haven't had much, much effect on them until recently. So I expect this to drive a lot of new litigation and a lot of additional litigation in cases that are highly contested. So uh, what are your thoughts about it? Any, uh, anything you'd add to that? I think that the, the scary part, and I'll use the word scary loosely, is that uh, before I believe that judges had more discretion to render a protective order, right? Because a court could say uh, the, the likely to occur in the future part uh, is fact fact-based. Um, I think this new amendment essentially puts the court in a corner um, and requires it to find just according to this that family violence has occurred. And then if the court finds that family violence has occurred, the court shall render a protective order um, as provided by section 85.022, applying only to a person found to have committed family violence and may render a protective order as provided by section 85.02. One, applying to both parties that is in the best interest of the person protected by the order or member of the family or household of the person protected by the order. So, I mean, I think that as far as that goes, if you can truly show by the facts that this person has committed an act of family violence, then I think it's time to have a very serious discussion with your client in regards to the possible consequences of of that um, as far as uh, that goes, um, because I think the court's hands are tied once that is shown by clear and convincing evidence that that's occurred. Okay. Um, what's another one that comes to mind as being important to you? Um, I would say there have been uh, changes with child support. Uh, some of those changes are small. Um, for example, uh, when we all experienced the COVID pandemic, the court switched over and started to allow more electronic signatures on uh, court documents. Uh, this amendment has made it where in suit affecting parent-child relationships, when there's a what we call a waiver of citation, um, a person can electronically sign it now. It doesn't necessarily have to be notarized um, as before. I would say it can become a problem when you can only have a notary. Um, in one of my cases, the other parent was located in Mexico in a remote area and had access to the internet, but did not have access to an actual notary. And so it was a huge hurdle and expense to try to get the uh, court to make any type of accommodations in regards to that person waiving citation uh, in regards to that. And it's not, it's not fun trying to get someone personally served in, in other countries, um, especially other countries of which you're not familiar with or maybe in remote or rural areas. In addition to that, um, we have changes to the child support uh, arrears that say that they can no longer be reduced. Um, so unpaid child support payments. So that's what we call the child support arrears. So that means that there was a court order for you to pay child support um, and that you did not pay it according to the order. Um, 
So now those cannot be reduced according to the updated um, Texas Family Code. That's going to be in Section 157.263. So regardless of who asks for a reduction, whether it's the person who owes the child support or the recipient, um, the amount owed cannot be lowered. So even if you have an agreement that, so for example, let's say someone owes $50,000 in child support and they've reached an agreement with the other parent that, you know, due to whatever reasons they've agreed to, okay, I'll, I'll take $25,000 to settle the case and I, I will agree that you owe less than what you actually owe for the purposes of the court confirming those arrears. It has now been changed where you cannot make that change and the child support uh, cannot be lowered, even by your agreement, um, even by the Office of the Attorney General, um, uh, who is usually the, the the entity receiving such payments for the benefit of the child. Okay. Well, that's, um, that's good to know. Um, uh, to me, I mean, it's a little odd that you, if you agreed, you couldn't reduce it, but, you know, I guess... That's the rule. So. Well, I think it's uh, kind of geared towards, I mean, child support is supposed to be for the benefit of the child. And we have adults making decisions for children who do not have any say so in regards to support that the child may be entitled to. So I think this is kind of geared towards making sure that the child receives the benefit um, of which the child is entitled without the adults um, making decisions as, as far as that support goes. Obviously, the support to a minor is paid to the parent, but it is for the benefit of the child. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I think we have time for one more quick one. If there's one other one that comes to mind as being important. Yes. So I actually gave a CLE on this one. This is a change in regards to paternity suits. Um, There was a case actually out of the 245th in Harris County that came out in April of 2023 um, that was up on appeal. Essentially what occurred is that the presumed father's Uh, rights were terminated without actually having to serve him with a copy of the citation. So a recent amendment to the Texas Family Code, Section 160.604C, brought forth that important change. And under that, um, your paternity suits can now continue even when the presumed father identified through DNA testing um, as not being a biological father cannot be found. So if you have a presumed father, but and presumed just so everyone knows, for example, if a child was born during a marriage um, and that legal presumption is then made that that parent's uh, paternity is established in those means, then if he disappears um, and you cannot locate the father in that sense, then you can still proceed even if he cannot be found. Um, And those rights can still be terminated. And that's just an example of what you can do in a paternity suit. But for example, uh, well, that's what happened in the 245th, is that that parent was still able to be terminated. Um, The facts of that case uh, was that a lady had um, children and um, was a victim of domestic violence. And um, she consumed or she had, she conceived children uh, during the marriage and then moved here to Harris County. Um, Dad was back in another country, um, a Latin country, and she could not find his whereabouts other than she knew he was in a prison there. Um, But she couldn't identify which prison and where he was presently located. The court allowed her to proceed with the termination um, of his parental rights without service to him. I mean, you can see it both ways, right? You can see that, you know, it's really hard to find someone like that uh, or even know if they're alive. Um, but on the other hand, it's such a serious thing to have your rights terminated that it's, you know, it seems like you'd bend over backwards. Um, anyway, okay, well, I think um, that's enough for today. There, there are other, everyone should be aware there are some other changes. You can uh, review them. Uh, you can contact us if you need to. We'll be happy to help. Um, All right. That's all we have for today. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and leave a review. We appreciate all your feedback, especially when it helps us better this podcast. If you have any follow-up questions to this episode or would like to talk to one of us directly about your situation, reach out to us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com, or you can contact us directly through our website, waltersgilbreth.com. I'm Brian Walters here with Raya Jackson. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. 
For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.